Well, my name is our father, Emmanuel Katongle. I'm a Catholic priest of Kampala Archdiocese in Uganda. I currently serve at the University of Notre Dame here in South Bend, Indiana. I am professor of theology and international peace studies. The, the, the sacrifice of Africa, uh, it's over a period of time. And the reason really that is behind the book is that I was bothered, as I still are uh, bothered, by these ongoing challenges in Africa, poverty, violence, corruption, instability. What is going on? So that is the primary question that is driving this book. What is going on? And how do we get even to understand these recurrent patterns of violence, of war, of disruption? What is the problem? And I felt that most of the approaches to social ethics in Africa, we are trying to give answers, to throw solutions to this problem. Uh, whether it is in terms of if there is, for example, a rigging of elections, let's have another election, or let's have new monitors now, or let's bring in the technical experts, or let's bring in IMF and World Bank to restructure the debt and so forth. All these kind of were very good, actually, uh, recommendations. I call them prescriptions for what is wrong in Africa. But I realized that over a long time of history in Africa, none of them seems to work. Even in terms of liberation, uh, soon the liberators become the dictators and then you need another liberation. So we kind of move in this kind of endless cycle. So the question that really was driving this research is, but what is going on? How do we understand these recurrent patterns of violence of war? Some of them, of course, we are saying, oh, these are kind of issues that are in a way embedded in African history, uh, ethnic problems, whenever there is violence in Africa, some people think that it is an ethnic problem and so forth. I was not satisfied with that. So I really wanted to get into an investigation of what is going on, what actually is going on. And so what I, I embark on in the book is to provide a story of Africa. And the more I did this, the more I realized that much depends actually in what is assumed uh, in the beginning. So I really wanted to go back to what is assumed in the story of modern Africa. And here's what I discovered, and this is part of the argument of the book, here's what I discovered, that it is something like a ghost that is haunting modern Africa. I call this ghost King Leopold's ghost. And so I tell the king of the story of King Leopold, and how is the story really of greed, of violence, that kind of the colonial story. And I say something like that is still haunting Africa. That actually modern institutions in Africa cater for and pander to elite interests, to the total exclusion of a focus and a concern for everyday realities that affect the majority of people uh, in Africa. So then I make the argument, and this is the key argument of the book, that there is something about these challenges of poverty, of war and violence and greed that are written, if you like, within the imaginative landscape of Africa. And so then from a constructive point of view, I argue that what is needed is actually to reinvent that story, to provide new stories, to provide a new uh, foundation for African social life. And this is where I started getting into the stories, like the story, for example, of Thomas Sankara. Uh, and I love Thomas Sankara, and he forms a chapter in this book. Um, one of his famous statements is that you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain degree of madness. So, and I make the point that Sankara is right. For this imaginative foundations of Africa to be reinvented, we need a certain kind of form of madness. And that's what I'm trying to look for, whether there are any grounds for this kind of madness that reinvents a modern Africa within a new, a new story. Of course, I am an African and I love stories, but through my education, through my studies, and my background is in philosophy, I, I discovered how story is not just kind of these kind of anecdotes, but story actually structures everything. Uh, reality is shaped through stories. Um, institutions are shaped by stories that underlying uh, whatever institution, whether it is a nation state like Kenya or America, the, that itself is a story. And these kind of stories begin as uh, assumptions and then they get institutionalized 
and then they structure the life. So that in the end, in a way, there is almost a kind of circularity uh, between story, imagination, and practice. Uh, if you assume, for example, from the beginning, that there is nothing good out of Africa, and that becomes then the foundation of modern institutions like nation state and the whole economics is built on that assumption. And of course, then you don't see that assumption, you don't see the story, but it remains a kind of hidden in the kind of the imaginative foundations, as I call them. But then that is what is the basis for whatever you set up, whether it's institutions of education, economics, with the assumption that all oh, this is just Africa, these are just mere Africans. There is really nothing good out of Africa. The only thing that can perhaps be done in Africa is just a little bit of work that prevents the worst happening, but really we don't expect much out of Africa. So if that becomes the kind of the foundational framing of modern institutions in Africa, then lo and behold, they produce exactly the same expectations that are assumed in the beginning. If you assume that people are sort of interested and that is then used to set up an institution like, that is actually based on that institution, it does in fact end up producing people who are sort of in interested. The, the kind of the sort of fulfilling nature of, of stories as part of the imagination, then they kind of in a way give rise to uh, characters that reflect that. And that's what I see that is going on within Africa. The whole modernity in Africa has assumed that Africans are just mere Africans. There's really nothing good out of Africa. Anything to really matter has to come from outside. That's what I see is going on within the imaginative landscape of Africa. That even though the nation state right now is in the hands of Africans, that it continues in a way to perpetuate that mythology, that myth, that story, that there is really nothing good out of, of Africa. So it becomes a kind of sort of fulfilling uh, prophecy. I am a theologian and that's why I'm approaching these issues from a theological um, point of view. And kind of really asking, what is the difference that Christianity can make in Africa? especially since Christianity is widespread in a number of places, there are churches. So I talk about this image of churches and coffins, are these two images that kind of characterize the content of Africa. So that's my whole point. Uh, what, what difference does Christianity make? Can Christianity make any difference? And so when I invoke Sankara and say, uh, you cannot cut out change without a certain degree of madness, I'm inviting Christianity to live into this kind of madness. I, I frame this book theologically for moving from what I call the sacrificing of Africa towards the theological point of view that I call the sacrifice of Africa. So that's the title, meaning sacrifice from its Latin word, sacra facere, of making of sacred. Uh, and so there is that kind of theological uh, point. The first discussion that has come of responding to this thing that yeah, the book, the analysis is good. He's engaging social scientists, philosophers, economists, and is good. But then he kind of narrows it down by kind of trying to focus uh, theologically. And I, I say, but that's the most exciting thing actually <laughs> about the book. It is very specifically uh, oriented. It has a specific readership in mind. It has a, a specific audience in mind. I, I want Christians to take the Christian story seriously uh, as a form of social engagement. In that kind of connection, I have nothing but to say, yeah, I'm glad that the, the, the book the book is focused and from a Christian point of view, because I think that in a way helps to provide uh, a kind of narrative anchors to, to, to provide points of reference for those who self identify as Christian, where others, of course, also can learn the kind of engagement that can come out of theological or religious, religious tradition. Uh, the other discussion that has come out of, of, of the book is say, yeah, I think what he's doing is really uh, interesting, good. But the kind of stories that he tells are so micro. Uh, we need to change institutions, Uganda, Kenya, Africa. For that, you need to, an engagement up here with those kind of institutions. You need to engage the World Bank. You need to engage America, uh, these kind of big stories. But when it comes to providing way forward, he tells stories of like, for example, a Taban, a bishop in the Sudan, uh, who goes into the rural community and founds this Holy Trinity village. But the, the, yeah, I think there's something good, but they're too small. We need macro <laughs> solutions because the problem is so huge. And then I, I, I respond and say, wait, there is something that I'm learning from the story of Christianity itself, 
how it is a story of God becoming human and being born in a particular place and very concrete history and out of there in a way kind of work his way out into the ends of the of the earth that this is how actually history works that we need to, to take seriously this kind of grassroots concerns local concerns and work our way out of that into the bigger uh, solution without neglecting neglecting that uh, the macro uh, issues the third the, uh, issue that has come out of that is in my own in terms of my own scholarship and research and, and work is that I saw the number of stories that I told and uh, we are requiring more more work so I followed that up with really engaging these stories and that what is given rise to uh, another book uh, born from lament uh, theology and politics of hope in Africa as a kind of really uh, taking further some of these these stories and I realizing that all these stories that I tell whether it is Taban or Angelina or Maggie uh, there is something about lament at the heart of what they are doing and yet they are very hopeful they provide hope for, for, for New Africa so I engage um, this notion of lament and its interconnection uh, with the with, with, with the hope and that maybe finally the other discussion that I've come out is one of the consistent uh, emails and the feedback that I received they say oh we love this book especially we love its stories that it is all beat on stories we love this and so there are some people who just love the stories and they don't make much of the theoretical argument but they just love the stories whether it is Taban, Maji, Angelina, Sankara, the kind of stories that I that I tell. So that's also has been very positive coming out of, uh, of this work. First of all I want to be grateful uh, for that, that the book is available on the African continent now. One of the, the challenge that I had that was being published by Edmunds and they couldn't get wide readership in Africa. So I'm, I'm so grateful uh, to Chama and, and, her, and, and his team for making this book available and affordable on the African continent. The two things. One, I wrote the book in a simple, accessible way so that it can attract as wide readership as possible, so that as many people as possible could read it. So that, 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 that is the first thing that I would like it to be read widely. I would like it especially to be read by people in theological formation, religious houses of formation, seminaries, uh, so that we can really uh, engage this issue of politics. What's the relation between church and politics? What's the significance of the Christian story? What is it that we are doing as pastors, as priests, as seminarians? What is the story that we, in a way, minister into? I, I think this is a great book for ecclesiology, for uh, social history for on, on many on many points so i would love that uh, um, the houses of formation the religious houses and seminaries uh, really take the book and and, and read it uh, seriously thirdly I, I would like that as you read this book you begin to imagine whether the story that i'm telling is actually true in your own location whether you are from chad or cameroon uh even though some of the stories i tell are from congo east africa and I, I would like you to put yourself into the story and imagine where this actually is is, is true um and engage the, 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 with the book I'm, I'm not writing a gospel I'm, I'm just inviting into a conversation so really i want that kind of conversation to get uh, underway and and, and lastly I would like us to get onto the business of reinventing Africa. Uh, I, I would like the, the reader really to, to take this seriously. This is not just a standard academic book that all oh, you read and say, oh yeah, these are philosophers, theologians. No, I want us to really get into the business of what I'm telling you, that we need to reinvent Africa from the ground up. Uh, and so that it requires a certain kind of madness that the way things are is not the way things have to be. And that if you're a Christian, we have a good starting point. The story of the gospel is actually instead of a story of reinventing a new social reality. And so kind of really get into that business and each one really finding a place where to begin to engage that, uh, that reinvention.